Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this small excerpt of a much longer Patreon exclusive video. This video is up on my Patreon page and is primarily about sculpting feet. While feet are a small part of the figure and a seemingly unimportant part, they do play a major role as they are the element, the main element, that will sell the illusion of your sculpture carrying its weight in a natural and convincing fashion. We find several such elements, and they will change depending on the pose our sculpture is supposed to take. In a standing figure, the weight is concentrated on the legs. In a contrapposto, it's concentrated on one leg. And so other than the feet, the knees are a good place to really convince people that this figure is affected by gravity like the rest of us. If you want to see this full video or just support the channel and help me make more videos, visit patreon.com forward slash idcarnison and become my patron. There's a link in the description below as well. In the meantime, enjoy this excerpt from my Patreon exclusive video on sculpting feet. The toes can be broken down into two sections, and the two sections have very different character. One section being the big toe, and the big toe is proud. It aims upwards towards the sky, like a snobby person with their nose turned up. The other toes, the rest of the toes, are submissive and they aim downwards towards the ground, kind of clawing, holding on to the ground. This brings me conveniently on to my next subject, which is how to sell the illusion of weight being carried in a practical way. In other words, in clay, how do we sell that illusion of weight being placed on the foot? It happens in the toes, so we can start there since we just spoke about toes. The big toe aims up and the rest of the toes aim down. The big toe is going to have a large, broad shadow under it. The other toes will have a narrow, sharper shadow under them. And this is going to be the key to describe how form turns in clay. The breadth and width of a shadow. In areas where weight is being carried, the shadow should be narrow as the form turns quickly and close to the point of contact with the ground. In areas where weight is not being carried, the shadow should be broad, describing a form that turns slowly. Sculpture is a language, and at the highest level, you should be in control of this language. This means that your decisions must be consistent. What I described above is one way that I use and I'm consistent in doing it this way. There are certainly other ways, but you have to stay consistent in order for the audience to properly understand what they are looking at, in order for your language to make sense. A good habit to get into as you sculpt the feet is to draw a line underneath them or around them in order to separate them visually from the base. This lets you control the shape of the foot more accurately as you work. Later, you can diverge from this by differentiating the shadow between the foot and the ground, depending on the area of the foot and how weight is being carried in that specific area. As a nice little ending to this video, let's render the knee. It needs to happen, and it fits well into the narrative I've been preaching in this video about selling the illusion of weight being carried by your sculpture, or in your sculpture, which of course actually does not carry any weight, at least not in the same way that you and I carry weight. So it has to be an illusion. The knee is another place, like the foot, where a lot of weight is being focused. And just like the foot, the weight carried 
shows up on the surface, which gives us, the sculptor, an opportunity to create some magic, some visual trickery. At the knee, we have two bones meeting, the femur of the thigh and the tibia of the calf. To soften this connection so we don't have bone-on-bone -bone action, there is a fat pad in between these two bones. On women, this seems to be a more prominent visual feature on the surface of the knee than on men. We are sculpting a female here, and since this feature is really visible, once the leg is straight, it gives us the chance to show the weight being carried by the stand leg, and we can contrast the stand leg from the balance leg knee by doing this as well, which is really convenient. So, grabbing this opportunity is going to be one of those things that can only be a win situation for us. When we put weight on the leg, like we do on the stand leg in a contrapposto, we can see two forms bulging out below and on either side of the kneecap. It creates this triangle of three forms. On some, this is going to be more present than on others, and it might have something to do with having more skin on your knee or something like that. I don't really know. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. All I know is what it looks like visually and how much it makes the knee seem like it's carrying weight. So much weight, in fact, that the forms are bulging outwards at the knee because of it. We have spoken previously about contrasting bone and flesh as well, and here is a golden opportunity to do so. The kneecap, being the top of the three shapes, the top part of the triangle, the kneecap is bone, and so we can give it a slightly more angular treatment, slightly more sharper angles. The forms below it, being flesh or fat, will get a more rounded treatment. This makes one seam very hard, while the other will seem very soft and squished. By default, this squeezing of the fat pad sells the illusion of a lot of weight being carried by the knee joint. So, all you have to do is to make sure the fat pad looks like a fat pad, and the best way to ensure that is to contrast it with some other material, like bone, which we have right next to it in the kneecap. So it all works out for us quite conveniently, actually. At the same time, we don't want to draw too much attention towards the knee, so we want to avoid too many sharp lines, too strong of a contrast and a lot of small details. Notice that though this area is getting a fair bit of attention, I am avoiding small details. Every form here is broad and wide, which reads better visually anyways, compared to small tiny details. We've spoken about that before. And as you can see, there are ways to have detailed areas, like the knee, small sections of your piece with more information than others. But you should think thoroughly through why you apply the information there to begin with. Does it serve a purpose? In the case of the knee, I apply just enough detail, just enough information to make the knee look like it's under tension and is carrying the weight of the body concentrated on a single joint. Your sculpture, your clay, as language, is an interesting subject and perhaps a way of thinking about sculpture that many never reach or never consider. But sculpture is language, it's a visual language. And in order for someone to properly understand what is being said, you must have a certain amount of consistency within your own language. How the flesh of your human figure interact with its surroundings or with itself is a major part of this language and one area where you can show the control that you possess over your medium.
Thank you for watching the video. I hope you learned a thing or two, or at least enjoyed it. If there is something you would like me to talk about more in the next video or in another video, leave a comment below. I read them all and feedback is much appreciated. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.